This is George Gilbert. We're with Patrick Wendell of uh, Databricks. He is VP of Engineering, and we are talking about um, we are talking about specialization versus integration. We all know that uh, Spark is um, has done a better job of uh, pretty much anyone else of integrating their APIs to make uh, a new class of applications possible. But traditional trade-offs have made um, specialized products generally faster or more feature rich. So let's at, at a top level talk about how you made trade-offs that may make that traditional distinction less relevant. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a really great question and I, I think that there's, a, there's different approaches you can take when assembling a technology stack. Um, one is the kind of uh, um, best of breed, you know, highly diversified uh, chaining together of many different types of, of tools. And uh, that's actually not the approach we've taken in the Spark ecosystem. Uh, the other approach is, can you have one platform, one runtime that enables you a large amount of capabilities, but is still you know, relatively integrated with coherent and, and sort of well-specified APIs that, that work well together. Um, so I think in Spark, we've actually found that taking the, the unified approach has had a lot of benefits. Um, one of them is that, uh, from what I've seen from our customers and our users, uh, there's kind of common th themes that uh, a particular big data user will want to see in the platform they're investing in. They want to see security that's kind of coherent and makes sense and holistic in the way that they're thinking about it. Um, they also want to be able to train their employees to um, sort of understand the broad details of the of the platform, and uh, they also want to exchange data and move data quickly with high performance between different types of problems. Like they might have a, a data ingest or ETL problem. They're just collecting data from 100 sensors and trying to you know clean it up and put it in the right format. They might have a querying problem where they have some analysts who want to actually run some SQL queries on that data, and then they have a data mo a modeling and machine learning team that's trying to do some predictive analytics on that data. When we go into companies, we see all these different problems. And the approach we took with Spark was to build a unified, kind of coherent engine that can solve all of those problems for the customer. Um, it, I think we've also found that the traditional things you might give up in that model, um, you know, maybe you'd give up performance, maybe you'd give up uh, a little bit of some expressivity. The way that we've designed the APIs in Spark, we don't feel like we've given much of that up. I mean, it's performance competitive with many of the kind of specialized tools out there. So other than owing to the collective IQ of the development team, what are some of the things you did to do <laughs> yeah. that? Yeah, so I wish I could say it's just we're, you know, we're smarter, but that's, <laughs> not, that's not really it. The, the benefits of having a shared engine are that you get a lot of engineering investment in these key primitives. So the things I mentioned, mentioned for you, Tungsten, for instance. Tungsten, in, in one part of it is how can we better use memory inside of a Spark application? It right. turns out that streaming applications and query processing and machine learning are all very, very memory intensive. Right. So if we can optimize that core primitive, we can have 10, 15 really right engineers think about how to make that one part work really well. It benefits broadly all of these use cases. Um, a good example in uh, kind of an older, older school example of this type of thing is uh, the Java virtual machine. So the Java virtual machine was trying to solve the problem back in the day of building one application platform that uh, you know, it was not quite as specialized as if you're writing something directly for a specific hardware. Um, but they presented really nice APIs for the users, and they had nice ways of debugging and of, uh, of making that portable across many different environments. But today, the Java Virtual Machine has had so much investment poured into that low-level engine that in many cases it actually outperforms uh, applications that are more specifically written against uh, specific hardware because they can do all kinds of runtime profiling and other things. And you have had hundreds of engineers for 10, 15 years trying to make that thing really, really performant. So the idea that you give up something in order to use a more generic platform, it actually isn't true uh, because of the kind of ecosystem effect. That platform is very, very powerful. And Spark is a, a sort of newer example of the same type of phenomenon. Um, where we have a lot of investment in these core parts of Spark that mean that to kind of replace or compete with that level of optimization would be very, very hard for a specialized system. Okay, so, and in the previous segment, we talked about um, some of the trade-offs you made to be competitive with MPP SQL engines or, or to be competitive in a complementary way, not doing exactly what they do the same way. So um, another topical um, feature areas, stream processing. And there are, there are some where um, they say, you know, this is, this is what we focus on and we are, you know, really performant. We can handle per event processing. 
um, if you know that might be relevant at the edge. Um, what are some of the trade-offs you make so that um, you can be competitive with them? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So a lot of the optimizations in Spark 2.0 are related to reducing the latency around stream processing. Um, <clears throat> the, the kind of space we target is l latencies in the hundreds of milliseconds and higher. If someone's doing a high frequency trading or some kind of thing, where, you know, that's often something where they're, writing, they're using custom hardware. It's a very, very special, specialized application. Uh, what we target is, is kind of what we think are the vast majority of stream processing jobs, where they're trying to do some reaction in the sub-second sub range. And that includes even you know, credit card fraud Detection. Is it is it fraud or is it not? The the window they have for that swipe of a credit card is about three seconds. So that's something that would be considered right. within the space that we target. Um, so that's been a big focus of ours in, in Spark 2.0. Do you see um, do you see a, a change in uh, architecture where um, there's more analytics being done at the edge, and that there are therefore demands different demands on um, latency on footprint, you know, memory footprint, processor, you know, demands. Um, yeah, I think there's a few architectural changes that are interesting. So one, relating to what you said, I think we do see a proliferation of this kind of sensor device kind of uh, environment where you might have hundreds or thousands of small, very low powered devices that are collecting data right. and, and aggregating it. And usually Spark doesn't quite push out that far. So we, uh, we don't have people running Spark on like uh, IoT chips in, uh, in random devices, but we get pretty close to the front. So usually those data, that data could directly be ingested into Spark or go through a message broker kind of system and then right into Spark. The, the main thing I've seen is people trying to reduce the time of that latency as much as possible. And it, it's very challenging because um, even if you can get the average case to be really good, so maybe on average you have, uh, it takes you know less than 20 seconds to get data from your end devices over a network through some message broker to Spark. Um, in practice, the it's the worst case latency that's the problem. Um, if you have a thousand devices, uh, some of them are going to be slow. Some of them might be turned off. Some of them might not have cell service for a small amount of time. So the problems that we see around this type of application is largely about how do you reason about giving results when you don't even know if the data is completely finished because you still have data coming in. And, and structured streaming has that event time. Yes. It's just then that the latency of the analytics is going to be really slow. Um, or it's going to be continually updated. As yeah, you get so you kind of have two options. You're exactly yeah. uh, um, getting it right. So you have two options in this world. One is that you give results right away, right. but they may be less accurate um, because they may get incrementally updated later. Best effort results. Best effort, yeah. Another one is you wait a certain amount of time, right. uh, but then the results take longer to deliver, but they're more accurate. Right. But because of this type of architecture, it's rarely the case that like one millisecond versus 500 milliseconds really matters because it tends to be that the data in just time is at least in the seconds, and in many cases, it's actually in multiple minutes. Minutes. Uh, so, so that's kind of the design space we were targeting. Are, are you are you um, targeting at all the moving Spark down to sort of gateway devices that are near the edge? Not not the SCADA, you know, uh, hardwired, you know, uh, uh, board that's in in the turbine or the, you know the wind turbine or the the gas generator or whatever. Yeah. But the there might be a an edge at x86 machine that's on the factory floor in the you know on the network. Yeah, that's a great question. It's that's a little sci-fi for us right now. Uh, we tend to kind of assume that the data has been somewhat aggregated already by the okay. time it gets to Spark. I, I've seen in specific applications they might have some earlier aggregation tier that's doing that logic. And there's other tools for that, like people use Flume and Kafka and some of these other tools to do that. Okay. So right now that shipping of bits and aggregation is not kind of in scope for Spark, but in a future world I could see that happening. It's probably not on the very short-term roadmap though. Okay. Um, I want to come back to um, some of the, the popular applications uh, that we that we talked about. Sure. Um, recommendations. You know, now that we have continuous processing, how might the, how might those change? And 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 then um, you know, in a in a system that relies on on batch processing. Um, how much richer would a continuous processing system be? Yeah, so the, the, this is also something you should talk with Joseph about because that's kind of a very machine learning kind of question. But I think the, the biggest benefit um, in the sort of continuous processing world, uh, as I've said before, is that being able to enrich 
the model with new data as it's coming in. And that's something that will be coming over the Spark 2.x line. Um, and okay. so that just means being able to, I'll give an, as, as an example, uh, recommendations are all about understanding every dimension of the user and as much learning as much information as you can in order to tell them what to do next. But often that data that you're learning about the user is coming right as you're trying to make the recommendation. So for instance, I'm browsing products on Amazon. Uh, they would love to have that latency be very low where they could actually use the products I've browsed in the last 10, 20 seconds to give me a recommendation on the next time I load a page and say, oh, well, you're just using this, right. reviewing these products. And then based on these products and your entire history and what we know about you and you know what, what your potential buying patterns are, here's what we're recommending to you. If that's a batch workload, they need to wait 24 hours for the most recent data to kind of influence the model. Okay. So you might have noticed uh, sometimes you're shopping online for something, and then you log in like a day later, and you see an ad for that thing that you were shopping for, but now it's 24 hours later, you've kind of forgotten about the thing, you don't really care about it much anymore. If that latency can get down to be on the order of seconds or minutes, it's kind of part of the user session experience, and uh, that can significantly improve the, the response rate for those recommendations. Okay. Let me switch tacks for a moment. Sure. We've talked about Databricks' um, implementation of Spark as an end-to-end -end coherent and integrated experience. Um, but if you want to add some services, like you know, you want to have persistence, like not just file system, but sort of database, um, and and you want to have you know ingest. So you, you've got Kafka. Let's say you've got Cassandra. Um, I I think uh, I I've read that. Many people would add Akka, and then you need Zookeeper, and you need three of each. You know, so already you're at 12 servers. So even though Spark and the Databricks you know version is you know uh, more comprehensive than say older uh, architectures, it's still got a lot of moving parts. How might how might uh, we expect? Databricks and Spark to evolve over, over time to have fewer moving parts? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So I think um, the one thing we don't really do is storage. That's a, a, a big decision that both Spark and now Databricks has made early on. And, and I think you're right that there are moving parts, but from what we've heard, the ability to kind of compose multiple data sources is one of the most powerful and, and well-liked aspects of, of Spark. The, the old data warehousing model is like, you have a you know, golden set of servers, and it's very hard to get data in there, and, uh, and that's where everything sits, and it's kind of the, the cathedral. Um, what we see a lot more is, is kind of to your point, they might have some data in Cassandra, they might have some data in Redshift, they have some streaming data coming through Kafka, and that separation of concerns actually enables them to be very agile in the way they're building applications. So I don't necessarily think it would be a good thing if Spark went into the storage business, for instance, and that's not really our, our plan in the short term. I think the, the right move is to have a, a, a very powerful general query engine that integrates the, the user interface and, and all the experience of kind of solving the analytics problem, and uh, one or two storage systems that are popular and that are robust and work really well, and I think that's kind of as simple as it can possibly get, unless you want to sacrifice a lot of agility. And when you talk about one or two storage systems, are, are you talking about that might be native options or just that you do deep integration with through the data source API. Yeah, it's more likely that we'll do deep integration with them. Okay. Um, uh, the, the, the beautiful thing about the way people consume software in the cloud is they actually, they largely consume services. So you mentioned like you might have one or two servers running for this or that, but, but very few people are running their own servers and that's becoming less and less over time. It, I'll give you an example. So like the, the, by far the number one uh, storage that's used with Databricks is Amazon's S3, S3 storage. Okay, now think about how disruptive that's been in the market. It has nine nines of reliability. It's the most reliable storage system ever built. They basically have never lost a byte of data on that system, and it's extremely cheap. So uh, good luck competing with that in the in the marketplace. Um, and I think that the way that people consume S3 is as a service. They don't think about which servers they're spinning up or down. They just have some APIs that say, give me this range of a file and, and list the files in these very basic primitives. And, uh, and that works super well. I mean, it's a very, very successful project, the S3 project for Amazon. So I think the way that we see the software world going in the future is uh, as consumers thinking about two or three main services, some storage, um, uh, and you know, hopefully Databricks in there with the Spark for, for all of the analytics uh, component, and putting them together in a way that, that enables them to very quickly build new applications. Okay, really quick, um, last word. 
Uh, do you see notebooks playing a role in democratizing access to all the analytics? The yeah, it's hard to answer that quickly. I'll tell do my I'll do my best, okay. but um, but I think that uh, w from what we've seen, so our product is completely notebook based. By the way, if you walk around, you'll see some on the on the walls on some TV screens around here. But uh, it's definitely really really changed the way that folks interact with data. And what I I like to see is that you have tens of thousands of students and other folks coming out of school that really understand this abstraction. And, uh, and I think it has a chance to supplant like many other of the traditional interfaces that you see. The traditional ones being like a SQL shell, a very basic shell, right. or a, a BI tool. It's kind of somewhere in between those, those two. A computational document. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so I, I think it has a chance to, to be really big, and, and that's why you know, we obviously chose those abstractions as our key, key interface in the product. Okay. This is George Gilbert. We're on the ground at Databricks. We've just been talking with Patrick Wendell, VP of Engineering, and we will be uh, back with some more segments.